The key points of this video will touch on several aspects of the Zimbabwe cash crisis. First, we will go in depth on how the Zimbabwe economy has fallen into the state of despair. Zimbabwe's economy is in crisis. It's half the size it was a decade ago, and now cash is drying up. Banks are running out of money, triggering panic withdrawals. A raft of new plans have been drafted to contain the crisis, including a parallel currency. But it's all adding to concern that history may be about to repeat itself. It's become a way of life. Sleeping outside the bank is the only way some Zimbabweans can get cash. They've been cash shortages for months because the government is broke. Some banks have limited withdrawals to $50 a day per person. Three days. Three nights. We spent three days, let's just say three nights. We come and sleep out here. Maybe tomorrow I'll withdraw a little money. Some the next day, maybe again on day three. When the sun comes up, the queue moves painfully slowly. Charles Matimba saw his savings wiped out when the Zimbabwe dollar crashed in the late 1990s. The 63-year-old pensioner suffers from poor health and worries he could spend days in the queue. I always think about my, my, my time wasted. 25 years is not a joke, but it was going for nothing. So I don't know who can help us to ask the government, what about, about those pensioners? who lost their money, who lost those years, like 25 years, like 30 years. We didn't get anything till now. That's where my problem comes. In 2009, Zimbabwe demonetized the Zimbabwean dollar, their national currency, in favor of the U.S. dollar. The following segment will go in depth about the reasoning behind this decision and its impact on the economy of Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe used to have its own currency, but the presses couldn't keep up with a runaway inflation rate that reached 500% in 2009 and led to this, the famous $100 trillion note worth about 300 US dollars at the time. The currency eventually collapsed and Zimbabwe has since been circulating US dollars, South African rand and even Chinese yuan. But cash is running out. A year ago, Zimbabweans were using candy as small change, prompting the Reserve Bank to issue so-called bond coins. Now the Reserve Bank announced it's preparing to print special bond notes pegged to the U.S. dollar. Critics accuse the government of rigging the economy. The majority of the people who have to go out and find their wares cannot use the bond. And it means that our people will become even poorer and poorer and poorer. There is no economy which is run on the basis of uh, uh, a paper which has no financial value. Zimbabwe has nine currencies which are legal tender, but not all of them are accepted on the streets of Harare. And just a stone's throw away, I'm going to find out just how many different currencies are accepted in average retail stores. What about the Chinese currency yuan? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Dollars and euro. Dollars and euro. Dollars and, 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 and rand. Dollars and rands. You take dollars and rands. You take dollar, dollar and euro. And you, yeah. Would you accept Chinese currency? I don't want Chinese currency. Did you accept rands previously, though? Yes. That was, when did you stop? I think when it started falling last year. But why exactly has the country been forced to demonetize its currency? The answer is hyperinflation. In 2000, President Robert Mugabe decided to change his country's economic policy, implementing land reform. This meant that land owned by white citizens was given to black citizens who were often unskilled in farming practices. Not only did mass violence ensue, but the country turned from an agricultural exporter into an importer, gaining an unemployment rate of 94%. That's when hyperinflation set in. By 2008, the monthly inflation rate hit 3.5 million percent, meaning a single egg cost $50 billion, a bus ticket $100 trillion, and a loaf of bread the equivalent of 12 new cars 10 years before. Prices doubled every 25 hours, so the government kept printing more money to try to counteract the problem until the currency became worthless. Thus, Zimbabwe had the second worst hyperinflation in history after Hungary post-World War II. So this official currency switch will mean that Zimbabwe won't have its own independent monetary policy any longer. 
but it will be able to clean up the banking system and bury its worthless currency that has long since been dead. Zimbabwe has adopted a multi-currency system since the collapse of its local currency, the Zimbabwean dollar, in 2009. The most used currency in the southern African country since then has been the US dollar and South African rand. The Botswana pula and British pound are also among the foreign currencies allowed to circulate. The decision was unveiled by the monetary statement issued by Acting Governor of Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe, Charity Dliwayo. Zimbabwe's Finance Minister Patrick Chinamasa in his annual budget statement last year in December told the nation that the multiple currency system is to stay for a foreseeable future. A local economist, Mr. Mugaga, explains further. You realize that the move to introduce uh, these other currencies could have been employed to try to ease uh, the liquidity challenges within the Zimbabwean economy. The third part of this video will talk about how the cash shortage has attributed to the economic and humanitarian crisis in Zimbabwe. The video will, will conclude with how the Zimbabwe government has tried to remedy these crises. And lastly, we will discuss our recommendations on how Zimbabwe can get out of these crises. Zimbabwe depends almost entirely on imports an economic model that critics blame on President Mugabe's policy of seizing private farms and overspending. Zimbabwe still exports tobacco, but crops and sales have been crippled by months of drought. Dry weather has also fueled a malnutrition crisis unseen in over 15 years. The UN predicts more than 4 million people will need food aid next year. There's concern that Zimbabwe's cash crisis is fast becoming a humanitarian one. In 2017, we have to uh, tackle the issue very decisively and very clearly, the issue of the debt overhang. As far as the country is concerned, we owe $11.2 billion, uh, and that needs to, to be tackled in a very clear way. Uh, we've, we know that it's being worked on, but we now need to start communicating what exactly is the plan. The finance minister and central bank governor have already cleared long-standing arrears to the IMF and hope to settle outstanding obligations to other creditors in 2017. They have scarce resources to do so and will need to control the purse. We need uh, to control the fiscal deficit and make sure that it doesn't run away and expenditure, uh, essentially austerity uh, to create fiscal space, reduce your, your, your expenditure, grow the cake. And how do you grow the cake? Stimulate productivity um, and, and, and make sure that you attract foreign direct investment. FDI inflows have gone down significantly and most investors, they actually say Zimbabwe remains a, a problematic investment destination to, to do business. Uh, with our tax regime uh, is not conducive for uh, doing business. So I think government needs to prioritize uh, the doing business environment. Zimbabwe will also try to narrow the gap between imports and exports. The former outstripped the latter by at least one and a half billion dollars. The imbalance will maintain a chronic cash shortage that's delaying international payments. It is a problem. We need some, some short-term measures to allow companies to, to prioritize critical companies, companies that are being supported, to allow them to pay. And then obviously the issue of increasing liquidity internally by allowing bigger bond notes, uh, both in size, uh, maybe $20, uh, uh, to allow people to actually transact uh, in a meaningful way. Government has recently concluded 99-year farm leases, which could finally give resettled farmers title and access to funding. Getting agriculture going again will help substitute imports and generate a supply line for the manufacturing sector. Agriculture is projected to grow by 12%. If that is achieved and other reforms remain on track, then there might be some cheer yet in the new year. First and most importantly, Zimbabwe must cut back on government spending because this is a primary reason for why Zimbabwe is in this economic crisis. Government officials should work on increasing foreign direct investment by improving the reputation Zimbabwe has with creditors to attract new business to the country and stimulate its economy. This is essential 
because there is a 93% unemployment rate in Zimbabwe. Putting Zimbabweans back to work will help their stifled economy by increasing spending per household. Zimbabwe should also look to increase their production of crops because currently they are buying more and more food to try and feed their people. Increasing production by 12% or more will greatly reduce this cost and could even increase GDP for the Zimbabwean economy. Lastly, the creation of legal tender in the past has often proved to be an impediment to competition between monies. But in this respect, the monetary regime in Zimbabwe is in many ways unique in recent history. The truth is that in reality, all of these varying currencies has actually devalued their dollar and economy even more. Zimbabwe's central bank needs to trim their selection of currencies down to just the US dollar and the South African rand. These two currencies were chosen because the dollar is the most accepted currency worldwide and Zimbabwe does most of its trading with South Africa and has always been open to using the South African rand in their own country. The plan proposes clearing the 1.8 billion in arrears by refinancing existing debt. However, as the president of the African Development Bank explains, Zimbabwe has a lot more to do in order to get its economy back on track. We, we've been on the Zimbabwe issue, issue for quite some time. Um, I think there are, you know, there's the African Development Bank, that's the World Bank, and there's the IMF, um, in which we are working very closely together to support the country with what we call the areas clearing system. You know, essentially just to be able to get it back into the international financial institutions, to be able to get access to, 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 to the financing we can provide, requires that we clear the outstanding debt. And I think we're very close to doing that. I, I am very positive that uh, before the end of the year we'll be able to sort that out. I'm very, very encouraged. We've had a lot of good discussions uh, 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 by all parties, and I think we're close to resolving that particular issue. Um, but we look at other countries, um, you know, such as uh, Nigeria, you know, uh, of course, Nigeria is Africa's, uh, you know, <laughs> biggest economy. Uh, it's going through some rough times uh, uh, because of the significant fall in the price of oil. Uh, but I think that um, we've been quite encouraged with what we've seen most recently uh, in terms of the uh, removal um, of the quantitative restriction uh, in terms of foreign exchange, but also in terms of the um, more, more liberalization, if you wish, uh, of the exchange rate so that the, uh, the, the, the financial markets can have the predict predictability that is needed to be able to draw in significant amount of foreign direct investment which a country needs. Back to Zimbabwe briefly though, I mean the, the country's got a serious cash flow problem right now. I mean, we've had incidents where say from the 1st of July uh, doctors will not be accepting any payments from medical insurance providers which pretends a really nasty uh, public health issue. But an economy like that, with that level of cash flow problems, how possibly can they get back on track um, to resolve the, what, six or eight billion dollars worth of public debt they've got? Well, you know, I mean, there are, it's not a, a very straightforward issue. Um, there are issues, uh, political issues. Uh, there are also governance issues. There are historical issues. Uh, there are policy issues that have to be resolved there, and they are working on it. Um, I think that the, the real game changer here will be the areas clearance. Uh, once that is set out, sorted out, and the policy environment improves uh, to be able to make it easier for private sector to be able to invest, but also to have access to liquidity. Because, you know, if you don't have, you have a lot of medium, uh, and, and, and small and medium-sized enterprises in Zimbabwe that are dying to have access to, to Forex, uh, to be able to import machinery, to be able to import equipment and raw materials. And so the African Development Bank, we, we make actually uh, loans to uh, intermediary financial institutions, including most recently in Zimbabwe, to allow them to be able to have access to that. So if, if, if a patient is sick, uh, sometimes they don't get well uh, instantaneously regardless of what he says. So it's going to take some of it will be immediate, some will be medium term, and some will be long term. But I do expect that Zimbabwe will recover.